think we need to legalize it and free the people because there are too many young black men uh, in jail, uh, incarcerated over minor infractions that, to do with uh, marijuana possession. Um, and it's and there's a disparity between how people of color are treated when they're um, found with possessing it versus any other race. And there's also in Colorado, um, it's been legalized and there are thriving businesses in California and they're in DC. And while corporations are making so much money, millions and millions of dollars, worth of money off of selling, legalizing marijuana, communities of color are still suffering and in jail and incarcerated because of it. So I think that's such a tragedy and it, and it speaks volumes about the racial institution that we, that is our criminal justice system. So I think uh, free, uh, legalizing marijuana, which is medicinal, which is actually proven to help uh, cancer patients with chemotherapy, um, people with depression um, should be legalized. They would help a ton of people. The, I feel like when it was uh, criminalized, it was because of very racist reasons. Um, the logging industry didn't like that hemp is so cheap, and they lobbied to um, uh, criminalize it. And, um, also, it, because um, people from communities of color uh, were seen smoking marijuana, those who were racist saw it as this like drug that only people of color do. And because of various reasons, from corporations being against it and pharmaceuticals being against it, it's, it's, and also because there is this like racial aspect of it. Um, it was uh, criminalized, and I think we are living in the 21st century where there's enough science to show that this is good for people, that we really need to legalize it, and it would benefit everybody if we did, um, that we should do that. And also, we should, once we legalize it, we need to free everybody who went into the criminal justice system, went into the private uh, prison system because of it. So that's my take on it, and I hope that everybody supports legalizing marijuana here in New York and push our governor to um, pass a law to legalize it. At least we're studying these statistics for, quanti for quantitative modeling. And right now we're going to talk about cannabis and how I feel about it. So when it comes down to cannabis, I feel like it doesn't negatively affect our community in any way. I mean, people do try to say that they do not know that happens, but I know personally that I believe there is race, same race or same race violence in every community because you don't see black people in white communities, so you don't see white people committing crimes in black communities. So that's why the fix to that. And when it comes down to it, if it does become legal, we will figure we would have way less incarcerated youth than we have today. A lot of us, um, the cops when you patrol our bad neighborhoods, they look for people, black people who look like they would sell weed. And it's just like, that in and of itself stops these youths from having a successful life. When you get incarcerated, a lot of your rights are taken away. Even after you come out, it's really hard to become um, integrated in society once again. And I feel like it's very wrong to take away this um, their rights to a, a successful life just because of some need. And I also want to say that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of laws that are coming out and being um, put enacted in our society today that can help us, our youth in our community, and yet we still have the police going outside, stopping people who are wrongfully searching them and racially profiling them. I feel like that's very wrong, especially for cannabis. And if you look into the history, you'll know that this war on drugs started um, with the Nixon uh, with the Nixon campaign, I think that's what you call it. And it was just like, it was when he said it himself years later that he said he started it just to stop um, to stop uh, the coming together and uh, what do you call it? The coming together and the something of black communities and leftist communities and um, the hippies who, who were against wars and who wanted to smoke. So that was their way of breaking down our communities and our systems just because they they um they happen to also smoke weed. So I feel like that in itself, people should look like, wow, he did this only to stop certain communities from prospering. So maybe we shouldn't keep it up today in society. But yeah, we do. And people still have this um, huge stigma against people who smoke me, and that's really wrong in my opinion. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah, my name is Leon, and I'm still here. Back here, what's your name, bro? Yeah, so we were thinking about cannabis. Yeah, so cannabis is a medicinal plant. Um, 
Oh, cannabis. What is this cannabis? There's this discussion. There's these negative connotations. There's medical usage. We're here to have a discussion about cannabis. Sometimes when it comes to people of color or minorities that there's a negative connotation about it. Um, so we want to just um, debunk that myth too about it um, because actually now um, it's a new industry and it's going to be booming, right? Um, and where are we or where are you um, that can have uh, be a part of something lucrative, right? So um, we want to have that conversation. All right, so my name is Joel. Sorry again, my name is Joel Struthers. I'm a biomedical science major, alum. I graduated last year. And um, yeah, good luck. All the brothers in the So all the brothers in the I want to make sure that you guys finish your degree. And that if you need help, I'm not going to cheat for you, but I'll help give you that push that you need. All right? So uh, with that being said, um, know what that was about, right? Just nervous, so I'm shuffling papers. Let me put it down. <laughs> All right, so the next segment of this, um, we would like to talk about um, Meg Evers College Hidden Gems, right? So this is a special part of the program where we highlight students, um, faculty, um, just Meg Evers College community people who are doing amazing things outside of the college and outside of their workplace. Right? So this video is, um, was produced by Joel Steelberg, which is me. You know? So um, I didn't know I was a producer until now. So we're essentially going to highlight students, um, community members that contribute greatly to the college in any form or fashion. And the reason why we decided to highlight that, there are a lot of people walking around doing amazing things, um, business oriented, entrepreneurship, and they're juggling that in their normal day jobs, activities, student life. So we want to highlight that, and maybe that can inspire other students or other people to do the same. Okay, so if you'd like to put this video on. And it's a little scratchy, but uh, so good. All right. Hi. I became a model. 
professional models, I'm out of a fool, I need change back up, um, brother for brand, and Tommy has a figure, um, is in all different kinds of publications, um, didn't make it to where I wanted to make it, and, you know, kind of like fell back from there, and then from there, um, you know, moved into the fashion business on the other side, as far as being, um, a clothing owner. We run a business called Cam Reyes, and they will provide therapeutic services for patients who um, take marijuana or THC as a form of treatment. And my inspiration with that was more along the oncology sector and helping patients kind of deal with and provide care and for referrals. So that's where the business kind of came up. Well, originally, I became inspired because basically I was looking into you know, some things that I enjoy doing. I was like, that's something that I want to do as far as be my own boss as well as help out my fellow peers. Just give them the right tools to be able to be successful. When I did oncology social work, I ended up working a lot in the life care. Um, and a lot of palliative care referrals were made in the clinic that I was at. So I got to um, kind of hold hands with patients during the end of life. And a lot of treatments are not favorable for them. But marijuana sort of therapy services kind of helped them take on day by day and kind of still live, you know, a life of quality. And so I felt the need to create services now that the that this is a medication for um, individuals who have this illness and they can freely get it at pharmacies, that they needed certain services to kind of help them along, like how to monitor their mood, how to monitor, you know, their daily activities, the activities of daily living. And so that's where kind of the business idea came from. So usually I work for like one of my years. So one day I was like kind of brainstorming and I was like, it's the most harmful So I was like, why don't I just make a table that's what I'm doing? Make people like it. And kind of put it on paper where I digitize and make people like it. You know, I worked from 3 to 1130. When I get off work, I usually give them like 12, 12, 10. Then, you know, once I get off, I'll try to basically, I'll sit down and me. Few of the guys around will we'll work on projects or you know try to knock out whatever we can between you know 12 and like four o'clock and basically my day starts at four o'clock you know taking care of the kids at four in the morning until basically it's time to go to work. Can you tell me some of the struggles that you had to overcome while maintaining your clothing line? Well one of the struggles is um having a job. <laughs> Nine to five, right. and then still trying to maintain this um, this vision that you have, mm -hmm. you know, because you're here. Well, I'm here, you know, eight nine hours out of the day, and you still have to put your all into the clothing line. So that's one of the struggles, and um, also another struggle is being patient, because you just don't make a profit like that. Your, your clothing line just doesn't blow up. Out of, any, out of nowhere. So, you know, you still have to put so much time and effort and patience into it. Some people have this perception that, you know, you have a business and it's got to be two grades every day. It's not. So you have to make sure you get into something that you love. As I said, this doesn't feel like extra work for me because I enjoy doing it and I love doing it. So make sure that is a part of it, but you have to stay with it. You have to be persistent, you have to be consistent and it will take you places. So we're a startup, and so right now we're trying to focus a lot on group services. So we have a lot of, um, or we have a group curriculum specifically for patients who are using marijuana as a form of services. And we really want to just kind of open up the dialogue and for the patients to start learning how to self-track certain kind of behaviors or kind of moods, and so that they can start talking about how it is to be under this medication because it's new. Um, for the doctors who are prescribing it, for the pharmacists that are providing it, and for the patients who are taking it. So you're really, <clears throat> the patient is really the person who's going to be the best indicator of pain. But if they're supposed to be taking this medication, they might want to learn certain ways of how to titrate it. Like, are you having a bad day because 
maybe that not even with your son and maybe you're feeling pain just a little bit heavier. Is it more anxiety based? Are you um, are you feeling a lot of pain and perhaps you need a further referral? Maybe you need to speak to pain management, maybe you need a higher level of service. So it's really right now to provide a lot of information on how to get certified for certain patients, where to go, how to access it. And then we're hoping to start branching out the more we get therapists on board to start doing individual therapy. Well, to keep myself inspired, I look at my artists, I look at how hard they, they push them because, you know, when, when you're independent, it's a lot harder because, you know, you don't have the necessary backing as far as financial funds and everything like that. So, well, my artists, you know, we all you know, work hard, so we put together whatever money we can, you know, to come up with our projects and, you know, so basically I see how hard they work because they can easily, you know, sign with somebody else, you know what I'm saying, and, um, you know, get advanced, but they choose instead to work with me. So that inspires me to grind a lot harder. One of the things we do is um, Instagram, of course. Um, another thing that helps us out a lot is actually um, groundwork. So we do HBCU tours, um, where we go to Howard University. Um, these are all homecoming, homecoming tours. So we go to Howard University, Dell State University, um, Hampton, a and um, um, the list goes on and on and on. So what we do is every homecoming season, you know, we're, we're selling product and we're making connections and networking with, you know, thousands of people at these different events. Right. We had some bumps and bruises, and, uh, you know, a few, quite a few setbacks um, that was kind of, you know, harmful to us, but then, you know, we sustained and we're still going. Thank you so much, everyone. Good evening, my name is Milady Duran, and I am a post back student at Mecca Evers College. My original alma mater is Hampton University. Woo! Woo! Welcome to HBCU. Awesome. I want to thank you guys for coming tonight. And if you have any further questions, or if you yourself are a hidden gem, please feel free to contact our in-house producer, Joel Struthers, at joelstruthers at gmail.com. At this time, I would like to bring to the stage Akeem Clergy, to continue on with the program. Thank you. Hello, I'm Akeem Clerch, you already said that. Uh, I'm a student here at MacGyver's too. And we got two more hidden gems that are actually doing great things in the cannabis industry that we would love to get up here. And they're gonna come and tell you about what they're doing. So those two people are Vicky Clement and Arlette Alexis. Come on up. To the cannabis industry by happenstance, kind of something that was out of my control. I have family members who suffer from different ailments, and the use of cannabis has really ameliorated their health. Instead of using big pharma products, uh, we've taken into consideration using cannabis related products, and the quality of life that they have is just amazing compared to the big pharma kind of medication that was being given to them initially. So that spurred in me a very a big calling kind of into, into that moment. And so uh, I'm one of the founders 
I'm a co-founder of Cano Reyes, not two N's, three N's, Cano Reyes, and you can find out about us at canoreyes.com, and basically what we do is we work with different patients in enhancing their quality care and also educating them, because not everyone that is stepping into the space is familiar with cannabis and the effects of cannabis and how to manage their ailments with cannabis. So we walk them through that. We also provide safety planning because even though cannabis is a miracle drug and it's very great, you also have to have a safety plan no matter what with any drug, even Tylenol. You don't know any drug. And a lot of people don't think about that. So um, our foundation really focuses on that. We also assist people who want to receive the certificate in New York City for medical cannabis. Um, it walks you through it because even though it is legal now as a medication, there, there are a bit of complications in getting certified. So we assist you if you're a candidate on getting certified uh, for that. Um, Arlette Alexis is the other hidden gem. Sadly, she's unavailable to come, but she is a licensed uh, nurse practitioner, and her goal is really to open a cannabis <coughs> clinic that works primarily with people who are receiving this kind of medication. And you can find her business card out in the hallway. It's called Can Alexis. So that's all. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, so, along with that, we have a lot of opportunities that we offer at Mega Evers. Uh, and I'm going to start by introducing some of those opportunities. One of these opportunities is the Entrepreneurial Society. Uh, I am the president and um, one of the founders of the Entrepreneurship Society. We started it a while back because um, if, a little bit about my back past, I participated in a bunch of uh, business plan competitions and came around. And, you know, when we got to travel and stuff. And a lot of things is when you're starting up a business, it's just you, an idea, and whatever money you got in your pocket. And you're like, well, I got bills, so I got to do this. So what we wanted to do was provide a platform where people can come in, learn the things that they're missing on, because a lot of us, our major is in business, but we want a business, right? We want to start something. We want to create something that lasts long. So we want to create like kind of a platform for you guys to come in, you know, incubate your idea and come out and probably be one of these hidden gems or the next Fortune 500 company. You really wanted to like house and like kind of nurture your ideas from the idea stage to the big stage. So if you have any ideas after here, you can uh, contact us. Uh, Michael Crump is one of our advisors. You can contact him. And we actually have our creating a website where we kind of display all the mega evers and campus uh, entrepreneurs and we kind of like put it on a website and like make, give you your own website without any cost or anything like that. So we try to do this for free now. So hop on board and stuff like that. And we also have great people that assist us with everything. So this is leading great to my next segue, which one of our people who will help us with this is none other than the CFO of Page Evers. He's also an entrepreneur and resident on campus, and uh, he has done great things to help people. He's always available if you come into Entrepreneur Society. He's always help, ready to help you. It's Masatomo, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sakura. <laughs> come on up. <laughs> So my name is uh, Masatomo Sakairi. I come from Japan, and uh, so I came down, and it's just a little bit wrong, but it's basically the same thing. I'm not the CF, I'm the COO, the same thing, more or less, of Hegevity, which is a um, finance-related um, startup based in New York City. And uh, so that's my day job, but my other responsibility is to be an entrepreneur in residence here at Medgar. Um, what, what that means is, um, you know, as an entrepreneur, there's so many different things that you know you have to deal with, 
and you have to figure out if there's a real market, you have to figure out your business model, you have to figure out how to get employees, you got to figure out, you know, legal stuff. And I am here to help you, help guide you um, through that process. So um, I can basically do two things for you. I can sit down and talk through your, whatever you want to talk about in your uh, stage of uh, your company or, or your idea. The other thing I can do is I know a bunch of resources um, that I can offer to you, uh, which hopefully will get you to the next stage, to the next stage, and before you know it, you're doing an IPO and you, you're worth billions. So that's what I'm here for. So thank you very much. Oh, and my, my contact information is on the uh, pamphlet, so you can uh, just email me, and I'm happy to um, set up a session with you. Thank you. All right. So, as you see, we're working here. We're working, working, working for you guys, the students, the community that's part of Megaris College, um, and just take advantage of some of the op opportunities that are presented here. Um, and you should also look at this as a network event. Network is extremely important um, in every area of um, work, whether it's science, whether it's business, anything. Um, and that's how we form amazing relationships with people. And actually, that's how things get done. That's how that's what progress is, right? So we got a network. We just want to understand that. Um, and of course, you know, we have an amazing body here, and that's under great leadership. And um, one of the leaders of uh, our school and institution is um, Mr. Dr. Nervosa Maisie Provost Okarike. I mean, this guy goes to bat a lot of students. Um, That's amazing. Um, and he actually sent me a couple of conferences, money from his department. So you know how to get the recruiter. So why don't I get the new <laughs> uh, so, good evening all. Um, I just want to tell you how happy I'm here today. You know, and how momentous this is for the school here. As we are doing this, you know, it's always important for us to be at the table. If you're not at the table where things are safe, all right? then things will be safe for you. You always have to be proactive. You know, and so when Dr. Crumb came to me with this idea about hosting a cannabis conference here, you know, I said, oh, cannabis? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then I reflected too, all right? Um, I live in New Jersey, and you know, this is about to pass the legislation on marijuana, the legislation to legalize marijuana, all right? And so I heard on the news, universities, already discussing the curriculum around Panama. So I said, that's a very great idea. Why can't we always be proactive to start talking about curriculum around Panama? So that when our students leave, they will find employment in this industry. I'm sure the business of marijuana look at it in Colorado, in where it's legalized, is multi billion dollar business. So why can't we start having foundations around placing our young folks into that business? Legislation and regulations, you know, all sorts of things around that. So by sitting back and doing nothing, and the money will flow out of the community, it's not the best way to make that happen. So I'm very, very happy that we have here to you know, this here today. I told him that we're coming here, he likes to be around, you know, he's a place of water of what my program does, and I just want to seize the opportunity to thank you very, very much for the innovation that he brings to the school. I want to thank also Dr. Alicia Reed, who is working with him on this, and I want to thank the faculty, you know, Hasha and those who are supporting this, you know, because it's only when you are part of the foundation that you will make, you know, the fruits of the level. If you wait for others to make the chance for you, you will never be part of that. And I hope our students are here, you know, benefiting from this because eventually we are the ones, we are the ones to benefit from this business. 
is a very, very big business worldwide. And doing the kind of work that we want to start doing will keep us in that front. And we want all of you to succeed. And of course, when you need data, don't forget us. If you are in that business and make multiple, the multi million dollar money, then you come back and give back to the colleagues. <laughs> I wish I could also talk cannabis, you know. Of course, we are talking cannabis here because we're talking about the business of cannabis. That's what we're doing. So, once again, thank you very much. And please, next time, give me my own music too because I will dance to the music. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it takes. You need an institution where you have support from faculty and administration. Um, and that helps with the process of um, helping students to thrive you know, and be better persons of themselves. Right? So we definitely want to uh, acknowledge um, Dr. Oprah And he actually takes time out of a long day of like, many, many millions of meetings that he has every day um, to give work. And we'd like to appreciate that. Um, also, uh, I can tell you, I, I am a tutor, I'm a mentor. And a lot of that work can be done to help a lot of students pass now, as it wasn't for Andre. So Andre, can you come up for a second? And get the word? So he's part of the DMI, the Black Mill Initiative. Uh, he's the director, um, and he has like the kindest heart in the world, and he's really for the students, like really. So let's say a little bit about the program, what you offer. Thank, thank you, Joel. Appreciate this. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you guys for being here. Um, you know, I, I wanted to be here to support. And um, like Joel said, you know, um, we uh, I'm the director of the Male Development Empowerment Center. What we do here on campus is we offer support to all the students uh, academically. Uh, we offer social emotional programming. Uh, in addition to that, we offer mentorship, which is very important, um, as you guys know. Uh, without a mentor, you know, someone who could uh, point you in the right direction, uh, oftentimes our students get lost. So, you know, I, feel, I take that to heart. Very important job. Uh, in terms of academic support, uh, like the provost was saying, you know, don't let someone make a decision for you, especially uh, your, your professors, right? So one thing you want to do is ensure that uh, you, you're getting the good grades and we obviously point you in the right direction. Um, as far as this whole program with, with cannabis, um, you know, whatever you believe, uh, you know, the, the, the bus is arriving and uh, pretty much in our neighborhood, uh, we, we have arrived at a point where we're on the cusp of this thing becoming legal. So why not? put ourselves in a position where we can take advantage of something, an opportunity that's going to be offered to us. So this is why I'm here today. Uh, you know, I hope you guys definitely, you know, take into account, take notes, uh, see how you can become the next, perhaps, billionaire, millionaire, possibly. Um, but, you know, just uh, the effects of it, um, the young lady was stating that a lot of, uh, she deals with end of life which for me, um, you know, it, it was big because, you know, sometimes we think that, you know, this is just a recreational drug, but uh, some people out there in our communities really need this uh, to, you know, ease them in, ease their pain, and, and perhaps help them transition into the next phase of, uh, you know, whatever the, the, the next life is. So, you know, thank you guys for being here. Uh, thank you, Joel, for putting this together. Thank you, Dr. Crump. And um, I appreciate you guys. Where's my music? Um, hi, everybody. Good? Um, my name is Vonna Davis, and I am an owner of Cannabis License in Colorado. Um, I specialize in manufacturing, um, so I do supply chain management, I produce products, I formulate them, I get them to the market, and I have to figure out how to sell them in the market. Um, so I am an owner of a cannabis license um, in Colorado. 
Good evening, everyone. Shanita Penny. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the president of the Minority Cannabis Business Association, but I'm also a business owner and entrepreneur in the space. Uh, my primary business is Budding Solutions, we're a boutique cannabis business consulting firm. Um, I'm a partner in a 60,000 square foot grow and processing uh, operation in Pennsylvania, as well as a partner in an Oakland, California cannabis business as well. So I'm not only an advocate, um, but a businesswoman in the state. My background is in supply chain management, so it's exciting to hear people talk um, in such a sophisticated way about this industry. Um, Ten years ago, folks pretty much said, cannabis sells itself. I don't need a marketer. I don't need to understand um, supply chain. And that's not the reality anymore. It's real business, real opportunity. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Colleen Hughes. I'm the Director of Community Development and Education for Sativa Medical, which is one of New York's um, 10 licensed registered organizations. We have a dispensary on Flatbush Avenue by Barclay Center. Um, I am an employee of a huge company, um, and my background was in the wine business, and then I left the wine business to do have my own consulting company. Um, I wanted to try entrepreneurship and use my skills that I had acquired in the wine business to help other wine companies. And then when I found out um, New York was going to be passing medical marijuana, um, I made that my mission to get into the space. Um, I started networking at all of the New York City um, networking events around the cannabis space and uh, essentially be the door down at two different companies. Um, so I worked for two of the license holders in New York um, to leverage my skills and abilities to help navigate this new space in a way that would benefit um, not just people who needed it medically but help further the legalization efforts and to help develop communities and make sure that everyone had a chance to participate in the legal market. I think this plant belongs to everyone and everyone deserves a shot at making their living um, with the plant. Respectfully. Hello, my name is Paul Saunders and there are a lot of women involved in the cannabis space. I can see three to two of the women are taking over this industry by storm. Uh, my name is Paul Saunders. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I'm the co-founder of, uh, of Mez Branch, which is a lifestyle cannabis company based out of Colorado. We sell concentrated products which are like vapes, vape pens, as well as pre-rolls and different consumer goods uh, in the cannabis space. My background is um, in marketing and branding. I went to Hampton University, uh, studied, oh, actually my professor Dr. Rowe was my entrepreneurial study professor. So um, when I came to Mega Evans, it was a great connection. Um, but I started out in, uh, I've always been a serial entrepreneur. Um, first I started in music and then I got into uh, doing marketing for Audrey Reynolds and tobacco companies. Then I went into uh, spirit companies as well as a uh, uh, beer company. So I've been in the scent business for a long time. So um, I just applied that to cannabis, which is an amazing um, marketplace. And I saw some, some really cool um, concepts that I want to further develop in the space. Uh, how you doing? My name is Dave Vaughn, Christopher Johnson. Um, I am an entrepreneur and I'm a storyteller. So why I'm up here is because I think that, like many people, I had a preconceived notion of what the cannabis business was, right? So I affiliated that with being a drug dealer, right? And had that stigma on it. And I realized that I have obligations as a media you know, owner to tell the story, diverse stories, of the cannabis business, not just as a drug use. And that's why I'm here. So I'm like, I'm not in the, in the marijuana or the cannabis or the weed business. I'm here to tell your stories and tell your stories so people in the audience knows that there's other ways to do this. Like when I met Paul, I'm like, you know what, wow, like this is not just about the plant. There's so many more ways to make money and there's so much wide open space. So that's why I'm here for Thank you. So we're going to repeat the first question. <laughs> Side effect of THC. No, I'm just <laughs> so the first question is: How do you maneuver a business that works in the area, in the gray area of legal and not legal? 
i.e. federally illegal and state legal? How do you collect money and how do you avoid being shut down? Compliance, compliance is key. So you have to understand the uh, parameters set by the state program. Uh, being compliant on the state level is the only thing that protects you from the federal government interfering. Now, the Cole Memo, which was introduced under the Obama administration, um, allowed for uh, no budget for the DEA to touch states where they had a legal program, be that medical, or oh, that was specific to medical programs. Uh, so we're at a point now where we're fighting daily to end federal prohibition because the conflict between federal and state has kept the folks that look like us out of the industry for the most part. And so it's important that you, again, fully understand what the program in your state allows um, operate in a compliant manner. And in terms of money, uh, there are more banks today than ever that will actually provide services to cannabis businesses. Um, it is not full banking access uh, like you think about, uh, access to checks and credit and things like that. If it touches a federal system, you basically don't have uh, access to it. And so for my clients and my company, we spend about $4,000 a month for a checking account that really is uh, glorified money laundering. <laughs> so I work, um, I, I'm an owner in Colorado, um, which as we know, which what was the first state to go recreational. Um, so we have in Colorado established a lot of resources um, and networks when it comes to banking. Um, just last year in December, my bank account um, with Expo, which is a cannabis banking, cannabis banking company, um, was shut down. So my money was frozen for about 45 days. Um, being that it's cannabis and you're mostly cash operations, um, sometimes, you know, you can handle it. Um, sometimes you can't. So in that process, my employees got paid late. You know, certain things that you wouldn't happen in other industries did happen um, in my company. Um, what I will say, though, is that we have fought in Colorado to get people to understand that we have to be able to safely hold our money. Um, not only that, but majority of the companies in Colorado are going corporate, so they pay you by check anyway. So as we know, you know, you normally buy cannabis for cash, right? <laughs> well, when I sell my products to dispensaries wholesale, they pay me check. So I have to have a bank. If I don't have a bank, I can't sell them cannabis, which is very odd in a time like this. So. Um, now, there are about 10 different banks in Colorado. They're private banks. Um, they specialize in cannabis. So they allow you to have that debit card. They allow you to be able to write checks, um, account receivable, payable, the whole thing. Um, like she did mention, it is very costly. Um, I think in Colorado, though, because um, a lot more people are bringing their private funds into the state and allowing people to bank. Uh, one of my business partners, um, Gabriel, he actually, you know, has ownership into a bank. So I'm able to see it from a different perspective on how um, cannabis banking operates. Cannabis banking is held by us, you know. So if you have a lot of money and <laughs> you want to help people bank, you are able to go into that type of business venture. Um, it's, it's different, but it is possible. So. To answer your question, um, how do we comply in state? We, we bank in state. We don't bank federal. We don't go to Bank of America. We don't go to you know the banks like Wells Fargo, the common ones. We go to private banks um, that are far away in Colorado. You have to drive two hours to go drop your money. So that's another job. You know, we hire money droppers. So we hire people that have the ambition to drive two hours to Pueblo or Colorado Springs or Fort Collins and drop our finances. So 
Colorado is definitely um, doing a really good job with their private banking systems and allowing people to start investing into those. So. <coughs> did a great job answering that question. I'm not sure I could contribute much more to that, um, except for um, emphasizing the compliance uh, angle is that, you know, in the state regulatory environment, um, that it's the rule of law and you have to comply with everything and the regulatory bodies will come and audit and check and make sure that you're complying with everything that you submitted and said you were going to do with your security plan and uh, all of the compliance from seed to sale. Um, we're a cash only dispensary. Um, there's an app called CanPay that we have in Colorado also. Um, it's kind of like Venmo for cannabis, um, which is so interesting. Uh, but similarly, we have to also use local banks. We can't use any federally funded banks. Um, so there's those challenges. And of course, you know, in my area with the education and community development, I try to work with strategic partnerships along the way, like with universities and um, other partners to help further this space. Um, the federal prohibition on cannabis causes a real um, roadblock when it comes to being able to do the studies, to get the science, to convince the lawmakers to get out of the way. So I think the federal prohibition is still one of our, I think all of our targets are set on, on changing that tide so that we can get the data out and studies can be conducted in schools and hospitals without fear of getting federal funding to be pulled. So I think that's another thing and, and our elected officials really need a, a real education for the benefits of cannabis and that it's all of the things that have made it illegal are based on irrational ignorance and fear and uh, propaganda. So I think we're we're all here and I appreciate everyone coming to this because everyone that's here is going to play a part in helping to change the minds of our elected officials and we all have to work together on that. Um, so we actually have a Bank of America account. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that's the model that we chose. Um, when we created the company, we decided to be a, a brand in the cannabis space and license our brand and pretty much pick the best um, in class partners um, that package our goods and we essentially uh, sell licensing. Um, so that's how we kind of went around. Um, we don't actually own the campus license to grow us process, but we own the brand and we, we license our IP, which, give, which is our workaround to be able to use the federal banking system since we're a branding and marketing licensing company. So, no, we don't touch the pen at all. Um, but that's the model that we saw, which everyone has their own model. But personally, I didn't know how to grow cannabis, so I just figured I would save that for the best people and um, and work with what I knew. So that's how we, we circumvent the banking system. And it's worked for us so far. We haven't had any issues with banking or checks. We, we pay our employees through checks. We have healthcare insurance, we have coverage. So just like any uh, occupation, we have the similar benefits. Um, I go to any hospital, so we were pretty, um, pretty stable in that regard. Yeah, I don't know if maybe it's about way more job opportunities. You know, he doesn't test a plan at all, and he's in the business. Um, someone carries your money. That's a job. <laughs> so, hope you all take a notice of those, those type of things that you don't have to test a plan to, to make money. Thank you so much for that. Um, I do want to say that while the panelists were speaking, I was so enlightened. I think we all kind of or I'll speak for myself, we all have, or I have this image of as these states are being, um, you know, these like marijuana is legal, we think of like these crunchy people just walking around like high, I guess, can I say that? You know, but this is a multi-layered opportunity um, for everyone to get involved. And that is such an essential part of community engagement and, com and community revitalization. When people think of the word gentrification, um, they think of all of these people that don't belong to a community coming in and taking over. That's not what gentrification is. Gentrification is the capacity for a community to be developed, to, to be developed up to a standard. 
And the way to do that is to introduce creative new ideals, to bring jobs, to bring um, ideas that can help to grow a community. And this is it. This is the future, y'all. So we have to continue the question. <laughs> So it looks like you got the future of banking. Um, <laughs> so the second question is, um, what cannabis topics do you think would be essential to be taught in a curriculum about cannabis? Or business in cannabis in general? I think that everything that we're learning today is transferable is applicable to this industry and so whether you're studying finance or supply chain management having some subject matter expertise in cannabis will allow you to transition into the industry doing what you already do you know leveraging a skill set that you already have my background is in supply chain management and so for years I moved everything from motorcycle parts to beer. And so when I think about all of the things I did with any of those companies that I worked for, while people didn't see the value years ago, they see it now. And so if you just think about the fact that this is a, an industry that requires every single professional service that every other industry does, um, everybody has a lane. And I think that it's more important that universities and, and school colleges just wrap their arms around cannabis. This event is exactly what needs to happen on every campus. And I'll just share with you, I wore this t-shirt today. Um, it says, my HBCU changed my life. And it says, I'm struggling with my university, my HBCU, in helping them understand that we are behind, that we can't talk about cannabis employing more people than any other industry by 2022 if we aren't in the classroom preparing the talent. And so when schools are trying to protect their students from cannabis, they're doing the students and our communities a huge disservice. And so, to see the staff, the faculty, the students embracing this industry and this opportunity and being proactive. Because I can tell you what's happening in New York is going to happen very quick. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if you, she mentioned the 10 operators here in New York, there aren't minority players <coughs> in the medical cannabis space. But we are ensuring that there will be minority ownership and <laughs> Yes, um, science, uh, botany, engineering, all of the things that we're already working on, we just need to bring cannabis into the mix. Great. <laughs> Joe Southern is a professional water dispensary. And it's fine. I should have bought some CBD water. <laughs> question would be, um, I had the opportunity, I would say the privilege to sit in on a minority cannabis, it's like a, it was a minority cannabis conference in Colorado, uh, and a lot of, um, a lot of minorities brought up the fact that they were highly skilled in areas such as accounting, um, such as, you know, culinary, um, things like marketing, sales, uh, production, just capability to just work, um, period. Um, a lot of them felt like they did not get, the pay wasn't there. You know, when you're entering into this industry, a lot of people automatically think, I'm going to hit the jackpot. You know, I'm going to go in, I'm going to be an accountant, I'm going to make three figures a year, or I'm going to go in, I'm going to be sell, I'm going to make 100000 coming out the door. It doesn't happen that way. And so it turns a lot of people off. When you go into an industry with set expectations and they don't meet your expectations, sometimes they'll just walk away and go do something else. A lot of people are not willing to take the time and understand um, the knowledge of the cannabis side related to their position. And it, it 
and I can say this because I'm 23 years old. I've been in this industry since I could, since I was 21. Um, I didn't come in the industry as a blood tender. I didn't come in the industry um, as a driver. I came in strictly wanting to be an owner. So I set my standards. I set my standards high, but I also set those standards high understanding the sacrifices that was coming with that. Well, first, I'm 23. I'm, you know, I'm a woman and I'm black. Hello! You know, <laughs> um, but I had a lot working against me. Um, I'm black and I'm Russian, so I do work with a lot of different cultures in my ownership. And in that case, I felt even more pushed back. Black young girl, you know. Um, I still did not let that stop me. So if you want to get into this industry, you can't have prenoted expectations of money. You have to get in because this is something that you really, really have a passion for. You get tested just like any other job. I sold insurance for years and I came into work every day and I wanted to, you know, shake the table. And that hasn't changed. I, I, on my way here, I got a call that, you know, my production team messed up in order. That still makes me want to shake the table. It, but I was broke. <laughs> For a long time working in this industry, I'm just being honest. You know, it took me two and a half years to get to where I am. Um, it was about to be a fight. I had to, my passion in food science, my passion in supply chain management, my passion in formulating and bringing brands to the market had to be a lot more powerful than my want, my willingness to want to be rich. You know, all this time. <laughs> audience and I you know and th there's nothing that can stop you except for you know thinking that this industry doesn't require you know more understanding and more sacrifices because it does it's just now coming out of prohibition it's just now you know and even in Canada I believe that um, they did make it federally legal but you're not allowed uh, celebrities are not allowed to release celebrity strains so there's no with Khalifa Kush or, you know, there's no, in Canada, you're not allowed to um, brand like that. The federal government and pharmaceutical industry owns most of that branding. So in this time right now, with cannabis still being federally illegal in the United States, my, my biggest advice on changing your career into a cannabis, well, being accountant, regular accountant to CPA and cannabis, my biggest advice is get your head in the game, get your feet in the field, and learn. There's no book, there's no instruction manual. The only thing I can do is give you my tennis shoes and say run and and see what it feels like. <laughs> but there there is not one. And my biggest challenge was people telling me that you know you. You don't need education in cannabis. You just can get in, you can just do it how you've been doing it. That's just not the case. And I wish someone would have been real with me and just would have been like, you're gonna make sacrifices. You're gonna be broke a little bit. You're gonna make investments that you don't like, you're gonna make investments that you like. And ultimately, it's gonna get you to your goal. So my advice is if you are in a specific career, just get in the field, just do it. It's, there's, just do it and you see where it takes you because the knowledge is, we don't know it all up here. We're still learning every day. It's a, long, it's a, it's a growing um, experience. So just get your feet in the field. That's, that's really well. That's all I can say. <laughs> I think as far as um, what curriculum you could offer, I think there's a good question about um, that. I think it's it's really imperative that um, learning institutions can partner with some of the industry um, companies in each state uh, to develop those curriculums so that um, people who are interested in getting into space um, can apply whatever skills and passions that they have. That's the thing. It's like don't get into cannabis because it's the cool, sexy thing. Get into what it is that is sexy to you and what you're passionate about because it's always going to translate into that industry. 
you do need a fundamental understanding of the endocannabinoid system, and I think that schools need to be able to start teaching that, um, the biology and physiology behind the actual system in our body that processes cannabinoids, which are found in the plant. I think a lot of people are confused about what THC is and what CBD is, and I think you know, having an understanding of how the plant reacts in the human body, how it changes um, sick people and improves the quality of life. You know, there's a lot of those things that people need to understand and move forward. You know, just build upon that knowledge. And I think partnerships with um, learning institutions and hospitals um, is the right way to go in the industry because the cannabis industry, we have we have the potential in working together on developing the cannabis industry to show our country and all of the broken systems that have failed us along the way how to do it the right way. And I think that this is a huge learning opportunity for our country to learn how we can come together and, and change the conversations surrounding all the other systems that have been broken for such a long time. I think that the, um, I think in terms of curriculum, um, like cannabis is a whole entire ecosystem, right? Like I think of the spirit industry, which is liquor and beer. So for instance, like I view liquor as being like purely recreational, right? But cannabis is recreational, wellness, medical, and then you have pet products. So literally you have all these industries that are impacted, that can be impacted by cannabis. So if you think of the spirit industry as being one dimensional, Cannabis is multidimensional, so the ecosystem needs doctors, lawyers, scientists, engineers, logistics, like any any occupation or any um, career path that you decide and choose, you can apply that to cannabis. So I think what also, like you said, it's a good point that to partner with facilities or um, or cannabis partners in your curriculum, or just having some type of dialogue or having you know a introductory level course where there can be some type of uh, correspondence with a facility like yours or you know processes or manufacturing or growth facilities and an educational environment could be very positive and huge. So I think it just starts with taking the first step of just having um, open dialogue saying look this is, this is you know this is the coursework, this is the curriculum, let me bring in these these players to talk to the students and give them the opportunity how they can enter into the cannabis space. Um, I entered about three years ago, um, but I, I saw um, my path into cannabis was basically through branding. I, I went into a dispensary in Colorado and I saw that nothing appealed to me. Like the packaging, the branding, I didn't see something that identified with me. So my, my background is really just creating an affinity with products, um, products to people, with lips to mouth and these types of, you know, uh, affinity, um, um, yeah, I won't say activation, but literally I build brand strategies to, to, to make sure that you drink that product or make sure that you engage with that brand. And I just see a correlation in the cannabis space and I want to create that and that's why we created these brands and brought them to the marketplace and our goals grow nationally and internationally with branding and taking the product to multiple states and platforms. So on the curriculum side, I think that some fundamentals, you know, um, you mentioned it's not a get rich quick scheme, right? So it's not going to be a multi-billion billionaire overnight. So I think it's like kind of like cannabis 101, right? So what states are, are legal and, and what type of legality? Um, what other supply chain um, steps you have to take to get it from plant to consumer? Um, I think also um, biology side of it, right? So this understanding is not just about I'm going to go smoke this thing or, or, or experience this, like, this high or euphoria. It has medical benefits to the body, historical medical benefits, cultural medical benefits. Um, indigenous people, um, people of African descent, know a lot about this plant. So, like, understanding culturally where the plant came from and why it existed and why it was made illegal by the U.S. government, and understanding capitalism and that this is a society we live in. So you have to understand what that means first. Like, what is a capitalist? Why was it illegal, and why is it now maybe legal now? And get off the thought of you know the fun of it or the or the money of it. Is the why it's become a product that can be sold to people and get tax revenue from to benefit the government, even though it's illegal. Like that's the curriculum that needs to be understood. The why. Can I have one thing to do? Um. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, something to add would be a history class in regards to, like, like you mentioned, like, why was cannabis illegal? Like, it was totally legal in America before 1937. And one gentleman, which was the first head of the DEA, which was Harry Essender, that this is a noted fact. He hated blacks, Mexicans, and jazz music. And that's pretty much the reason why cannabis became illegal in America. So just debunking the myth, it's completely made up. So all the propaganda that you've heard and you've seen and you've read, and what, you, what your parents have been told, or what you've heard, is completely untrue. Um, so just do your own research. I mean, look for yourself, check it out. But history would be great. Yeah, can I add one more thing too? I agree a thousand percent about what you just said, telling the right story. Um, but also, interpreting the regulations would be a great class to have, where you can go through state by state and help people read, because the, it's, it's really hard to read the regs. And there is like 250 pages and it's all legalese and it doesn't make sense to most people um, unless you're an attorney. And you know, you, you need to be able to understand the difference between may and shall when it's, in, when it's written in legal ease that you know, may means they're not gonna do it. Shall means it's happening. So being able to interpret the regulations and the compliance because that's the fundamentals of success is making sure that you're compliant with the law so you can't get in trouble and that you can just proceed within that framework. You have to really understand what it says. And I know in New York, the Department of Health website has all the regulations on there. Um, there is, I think there is like a summary that you can kind of glean some information off of, but you know, it's really light reading before bed. Just <laughs> All right, thank you. So there's a lot of uh, seniors and alums sitting in the crowd like, oh my god, y'all about to have a week curriculum? No. <laughs> but um, we're going to introduce the next question. Which you guys are doing an amazing job. Can we please give our panelists a round of applause? Your answering is providing like perfect segue for the next question. Thank you. So New York City is only medically legal. However, soon it will follow recreational legalization. So what state should we look for, look at for business protocols in recreational cannabis use? And it's actually a two-part. So what steps can small businesses do now in preparation for NYC recreational legalization so that the recreational business sector isn't overtaken by larger companies and small businesses can have a chance? Very yeah. Should tell y'all right now. So, who can we look at to understand, like, a, a model for protocol? What? Uh, for years, everyone ran to Colorado, and that was the model. We are in such a better place now. Um, the first states that come to mind for me are going to be Massachusetts, and I'm going to leave with Massachusetts because they are. Uh, focused on ensuring equity in this industry. Their adult use legalization included a social equity program um, and they identified four categories. And so they identified the entry level uh, position, the, the, folk, the person who wants to come in and work for a cannabis company. They also identified an entrepreneurial track. So you're already an entrepreneur or a small business owner and you want to get into this space, you're going to need a little left hand holding. They also said we can't leave behind the folks that were caught up in the drug war. Yeah. And so we are going to prioritize folks that have been uh, incarcerated for cannabis, who have a relative uh, who is incarcerated for cannabis. And then finally, we're looking at economic empowerment, uh, a category for economic empowerment that says that uh, you make uh, below a certain amount a year, you have a personal net worth below this threshold, and so we want to ensure that there's a lane for you to enter this industry. Um, when I look at the state of California, it is, it, it is it's, it's, it's the wild, wild west yeah. is what it is. And so folks are struggling there. They implemented a social equity program with no funding. They implemented a social equity program that did not do what the state of Massachusetts did in terms of qualifying you before giving you this license. And so in California, you have a program that is supposed to benefit the people that I just mentioned, but the only people that are truly benefiting from it are big cannabis companies that don't need a head start. 
Okay, so this, these programs have become predatory and exploited. Um, look to the state of Massachusetts, but even still, look at what is going right. Look at what opportunities exist and start to help them even course correct by improving what they've done in the state. In terms of small business owners getting ready, think about the things that you're doing. If you're a bakery, if you are a, uh, if you own real estate, you know, commercial property, that's one of the real obstacles to getting involved in this industry is that you typically, when you're applying for a cannabis business license, have to show control of a property. Sometimes in the year, year and a half, two years it takes to get up and running and actually generating some revenue, most people can't withstand, you know, and are burning through their cash uh, before they can ever get their doors open. And so, as a small business owner, I would be looking around and I would be building teams because there is no one man show in Canada. There is not a single person that can come to this space and get a license and, and, and run these businesses. We have to be collective in how we approach getting into this industry. We've never done it before successfully, and there are other communities and, and cultures that do it and do it well. When you think about beauty supply stores, right, they're typically not owned by us. They come into our communities and they want our money, but they're not reinvesting. So think about what you're doing in your neighborhood already. Build a team around you that can be an amazing competitor when you're going after those licenses. Am I able to just like ask a little question to you guys? Okay. Um, can I just ask like, because there's, there's a lot of you guys in the audience, can I just like ask you guys what, um, what you guys would be interested in doing in cannabis? Is that okay? Can, is it, can someone shout it out? Legal. Legal. Okay. Research and development. Cultivation. Transportation. Transportation. Investment. Stock. Stock. In culinary. Culinary. Um, well, policy. So law, law making, right? Community law. cooperative. I like it. Everything that you guys just mentioned, it revolves in what I call vertical integration. So the biggest thing about um, looking at recreational states and what they're doing right, as she mentioned, um, you can't do it alone. That's number one. Um, there are, I, I do, you know, Colorado uh, with us <laughs> being the first state to go recreational, uh, we did not do what Massachusetts did. We did not. Okay, we just didn't. They, they, did, they weren't looking out for minorities. Um, everyone knows Colorado is going through a huge regentrification process. Um, you get in where you get in and you fit in where you fit in. That's how, that's Colorado's model. Now, do I agree with it completely? No. But what I will say is that we have started, we do have a lot of minority programs that are in the process right now forming. I have the um, privilege of working with Ashley right now, who is the head of the minority. Um, she's the, she's kind of heading the minority um, Program, which is which is weird. She's not she's not one of us, but she's doing a great job. Um, what I will say to follow up with that, um, it's just it's the truth. I'm, I've been working with her a lot to get her to understand um, the difference between medical and recreational employment, um, re medical and recreational opportunities, because they're two separate different licenses for one. So a medical license is under one number, and a rec license is under another number. So for example, I have four facilities that I operate. Two of my facilities are med and recreational. The third is just rec, and the fourth is just medical. 
basically what that gives me the opportunity to do is fight in both lanes. Um, if the federal government wants to come in tomorrow and say, I don't want recreational cannabis anywhere, we still have medical <coughs> Um, so, recreational involves a lot of employment, um, it brings in more employment, so in my opinion, just because I've seen the success that Colorado has had with recreational, um, I would look at that state. Now, as far as policies and looking out for our people, no. That would be a no. So, there is not one state that has it completely right. Well, we There's not, California has been medically, medical for the longest, and like she mentioned, wild, wild west. You don't know if you're walking into a dispensary with a license or not. Um, so there's really no state that you want to honestly like do. Okay. I would say take a little bit from each one and what they're doing correct and just apply to you guys' process. But when recreational comes, it comes. And when it comes, it comes with a lot more laws and procedures. And for example, I'm a food scientist. My job is to know how to make products shelf stable. The same products that you guys buy at Walmart that are on the shelf, the spaghetti sauces and the orange juice and stuff like that. My job is to take a recipe and to make sure that it can sit on that shelf for a year or longer so people can buy it. So when you're talking about recreational, um, the health department gets a little bit more strict on your edibles. So if you don't have people who are educated on food science, then you're not going to have any edibles on your shelf in your dispensaries. When California went recreational, um, my friend is actually the ordering manager of MedMan, which is one of the biggest uh, medical dispensary chains, recreational dispensary chains in, chain in California. As soon as California went recreational, there was over 30 brands that got dropped from MedMan. Yesterday you went into MedMan, their entire shelf was full of products. The next day you go in, there's like three products on the shelf, and you're like, what the heck is going on? Well, you went wreck, that's what happened. And when you went wreck, it required you to do things that you weren't prepared for, which is one, follow health department codes. One, you're, the fire department's gonna get a lot more stricter on your extraction operations. Everyone knows extraction is what? It's wax, it's shatters, it's oil that you need to even make a product. So if your MIPS are not compliant, and if your MIPS are not prepared for recreational, then you're not gonna survive. So the key to understanding recreational is to understand what comes with it. It's not just this beautiful situation that happens that everyone now can use cannabis. It involves a lot of, um, it shakes up the entire industry. So as a medical patient, if you have epilepsy and you go into the dispensary and all of a sudden your state's recreational, but the product that you use to buy is no longer, you know, passing the code, then what are you going to do? What do you do as a patient? What do I do as a business owner? So rec comes with more than just, it comes with, it comes with a lot. May, the main thing that it comes with is it shakes up the state. So, child-resistant packaging is one thing that a lot of medical people, a lot of medical owners don't have to practice. When you go rec, you have to have child-resistant packaging. It has to be okay. There's a lot of things that maneuver over that people don't follow right now. So you have to be willing to understand the recreational laws in other states and then maneuver that over to what you guys are doing. One thing I will say, um, the benefit on the East Coast is that the medical programs are very highly regulated, unlike what happened in California for decades. They had a medical program that essentially if you knew how to grow cannabis and you had patients, you were involved in the medical market. There weren't real licensing and regulatory requirements. So it wasn't even just going wreck that turned California upside down. It was the introduction of regulation across the board that really flipped uh, those California operators uh, on their heads. Uh, but I certainly agree that we have to protect our medical program when we are going wreck because those patients are who got us here. Patients are the reason why we're even able to sit here in this, in this forum and have this discussion. They sacrificed everything and fought for legalization, sometimes from their deathbed. 
And now it's a privilege and an honor, and it's our duty to not only protect that industry, but to then open this thing up for folks that aren't, um, you know, critically ill. You know, introducing cannabis as a wellness tool is something that is going to be a game changer for our community. When you start to think about the fact that we are going to consume cannabinoids, we're going to feed our endocannabinoid system, a system that has been starved for decades due to prohibition. When hemp grew wild and the animals that we ate and the produce that we ate, you know, was filled with CBD, we were at our healthiest. We didn't have the cancers and the diseases that are prevalent today. So, you know, when we start to think about recreation, you know, adult use cannabis, it's great, it's amazing, but we have to protect our, our medical programs and ensure that, you know, the regulations are smart, that they don't drive out, you know, business owners, but they do protect consumers. I'm going to ask the panel, I'm going to ask the panel questions. I think a lot of people in the audience, you know, may have a brother or uncle or father or someone that has been negatively affected by the cannabis, uh, by a different name industry, right? So I think it's a, little, a level of fear. And if so, so it's, I wanted to throw that out there, like, people don't know where to start. Because it's like, it's, it's not legal, but it may be legal, we don't know, it's a lot of terminology. And they want to get started, they know that, you know, it could be profitable. What would you say is the first step they should take on that road um, in New York State? Look in the mirror and tell your story. Every single person that I come in contact with on a daily basis, I'm talking about cannabis. Of, you know, whether I'm talking about policy, whether I'm talking about it from a consumer standpoint, whether I'm talking about a business opportunity, um, you have to be willing to be vocal, okay? I, for several months, actually two years, tried to have one foot in corporate America and the other foot in this industry. It was not possible because I needed to be able to advocate for not only an industry that was accessible to our people, but I also needed to go talk about the fact that people are locked up. People are still locked up. If they're not locked up, they have a, a record. You know, the reason expungement is so important to me is because I was into my 30s, well into my career, successful, and was pulled over and charged with cannabis possession in the state of Virginia. If you know anything about Virginia, they have like the exile law, they have like other states of all right criminal. And I was a criminal in their eyes because I had an ounce of this plant on my person. Um, I also had the connectivity to the DA. I had the connectivity to, you know, say, hey, this is what happened to me. Within a couple of hours, I knew this was not going to be an issue for me. When I showed up in court, they waved me around a metal detector. I'm like, nah, I'm here to see the judge. You want me to walk through that metal detector? Um, they thought I was a lawyer. And I know a lot of other people that look like me that did not have that experience. They were not able to get student loans and go to school. Can't lease an apartment. Still have to check the box. There are real issues. This is not just, hey, I'm going to get into this space and, and, and handle some, make some money, and, you know, start some businesses. No, we have to fight every single day to ensure that every single person who wants access to this plant, access to the economic uh, you know, opportunities, um, or just a clean slate and the ability to conduct themselves and, and be productive citizens, uh, it's important that you figure out what you're passionate about as it relates to this industry because you will be fighting every single day. The people that love you are not gonna understand it. Uh, people that you thought, you know, I remember so many people just saying, Shane, why are you doing this? I'm doing this because it is the once in a lifetime opportunity um, for me to change my family's legacy and the trajectory and the place of generational wealth uh, for my family. So again, this the plant presents an opportunity for us to clear people's records and give them another chance of life. Even if they don't want to get into the industry, they just want to live. Uh, so you have to be able to have those tough conversations with your mother, your grandmother, your aunt are going to ask you why are you doing this. Um, you, know, you have to be able to explain that this is a, this is a medicine, this is a plant. Uh, so get educated, understand your why, 
uh, be passionate about that and be willing to go out and be the face of it. So many of us are missing out on this opportunity because we aren't in those rooms when, you know, a guy comes in and says, hey, I got $5 million, I'm going to go after one of these licenses. You know, we, it's almost like the Facebook thing, right? A bunch of guys got together in a dorm room, now they're billionaires. <laughs> That's just not, it's not happening for us. And so we have this opportunity today. You have to be passionate. You have to know what your value is, what you bring to the industry. And again, just be willing to fight for it. One of the programs that I've been developing for Sativa, because they're a multi-state operator, um, I've, I've seen, you know, I've been picked up for having cannabis also and had to go talk to the judge and that was fun. Um, I, and I've seen my, my black and brown friends be treated completely differently um, than I was in the system. And I think that that's disgusting. Um, and so what I try to do um, in some of the other contracts that I've worked on in the casino business and now in cannabis is the community development component and leveraging large corporations to give back to the community. And one of the programs that I've been putting forth in our company and I've been talking about this with like the Drug Policy Alliance and, and Minorities for Medical Marijuana and all of the other um, players in the game in, in New York so that we can come together on this to agree that these programs should be the responsibility of the multi-state operators so that um, when people come out of prison that they're treated with respect and there's uh, legal services that will help seal their records or expunge their records. States are different. Some don't expunge, they seal. New York is a seal. They, they will seal your records. Um, provide some re-entry services, um, therapy to help heal the broken homes and the post-traumatic stress that all of the communities have faced because of the drug war. And then once people have had an opportunity to heal and are, are ready to learn, then the multi-state operators who are forced into vertical integration because the way the laws were written here in New York created a very high barrier to entry. You need $30 million to have a business in New York right now. So none of us can do that. That's why I'm an employee of the company, but I'm smart and I know that we can fix this and we can kind of work together. So what, we're, what I propose is after we get the healing is done and people are ready to learn, we bring them to the grow facilities and we do an orientation, a seed to sale sort of orientation of what, what it's like to work in a multi-state operator or a large company, and then also what are the available career paths and ancillary companies. If you want to be an entrepreneur, then what are the different things, it's just like being in the wine business. You need to make those oak barrels to put the wine in. You know, you're not making wine, but you're providing a service and a necessity for the wine industry. Similarly with cannabis, there's, there's so many different things and everyone wants to touch the plant, it's so sexy because it's been illegal for such a long time. You don't have to touch the plant to make money in the space. So, just like, so um, learning what those opportunities are and having the resources provided by the folks who've been awarded these licenses I think is very important. And then working with developing GED programs, scholarship programs, if you go through the seed to sale program and you decide, hey, I wanna learn how to extract the oil in order to make edibles or to make my own vape line, but you get inspired and you want to get your chemistry degree because you just learned how to extract oil from a plant, then guess what? You deserve to get a scholarship because you were in prison for doing this. So guess what? Thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you again. Um, we would like to give the audience opportunity to um, voice any questions. If that's appropriate, you guys okay with that? So um, we're going to have one mic on one side of the aisle and another mic on the other side of the aisle. Please uh, keep the questions um, short and sweet with respect to time. Um, this is a very passionate um, discussion, so we want to give everybody a chance um, to ask their questions. So we're going to form a line. And if we want to limit it to at least to one question, we can. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Just want to thank you guys for 
giving us information. That would be a lot to learn. Thank you guys so much. Mark, actually, I have two questions. Since we have one more question, question is from Ms. Davis. So, your background was in food science. So, did that background help you much? Or was it more so just another option that you just wanted to try out? Well, it was just another option. Um, I think food science was a good option for me. Um, I think it was just another option. Um, I think it was just another option. 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 Or did it really, do you understand the question? Was it a lot of ground for your own part? Yeah, um, so just so you know, um, I got into cannabis because I was expelled in middle school for possession of marijuana. Um, my middle school, um, I, my father went to prison when I was four years old for drug conspiracy. He was gone 16 years of my life. Um, he was, um, one of the first people to have been wiretapped in the United States. Um, so my father went to prison. Um, due to post-traumatic stress disorder and depression, I started using cannabis in middle school. I got expelled for it. Um, I moved to Georgia, where I even seen, oh no, don't smoke weed here, for real, for real. Um, um, so I moved from Georgia. I did my four years in high school, and then I moved to California. Um, that's when I started to see the uprise of cannabis when I was about 18, 19. I then moved back home to Colorado, um, and I got a food science trade. Um, I then went into just business development. So my motivation to get into the industry was personal, it was spiritual, it was on a completely different um, mentality than a lot of people that I know. Um, but now that I do do food science, it comes into play. It helps me. Um, but I did not get into the industry because I knew food science, because I knew how to mix oil and water. I got in because my family has suffered. And I suffered a little bit in middle school. <laughs> but other than that, um, that's really why um, I got into the industry. So my background and what I wanted to do just kind of helped mold what God already knew I wanted to do. You know what I'm saying? It, it's a, when I have to talk about that, it's a, why I got into the industry. It's a little, it's a little personal, but my, yeah, my trade just helped. That's, that's really what it was. Um, but I did, you know, get more into my trade than I ever thought I did. I did more research, day and night, spent numerous hours, you know, just researching it. So it just took a lot of groundwork and motivation and passion, to be honest with you. Hello, uh, my name is Dizo. Uh, my company is called uh, Buttermilk 420 Farms. I'm a master grower. I teach people to grow. I've grown in four states. Because I'm from Brooklyn, so you know what that challenge was like. And uh, we teach people how to grow because when I just left DC, moving back to New York, hoping that this would get a little quicker in April, didn't happen. But um, in DC, it's like uh, you're 21 years old and you want to buy legal cannabis, there's no place to buy it. Which is kind of weird, but I know that. Because uh, they want you to buy a recreational card, which if you're 21, you really can't afford it. So they urge you to grow, and everybody should want to learn how to grow because that's where we come from, the growing market. My family, we are. I'm telling them I'm telling them they're not telling them that they're going to work against that. Listen, cannabis, if we are to ingest cannabis as early as three, four years old, we'll probably never have probably some of the diseases and probably some of the problems we grow up with. Like she was saying, because we don't start to ingest it until like we after our adolescent ages. But if you are and understand, like I had a sister passed away from stage four cancer. Uh, stage four cancer. Stage four cancer. Pancreatic um, cancer. And um, and two years ago, that led me into finding other things like Simpson oil and extracts and things that's going to help her with CBD. But see, the problem is the government is putting CBD as a legal thing that you should do or this and that. But they don't even want you to grow a CBD plant even if they make it legal. True or false? True. Damn. Well, I mean, I agree. I'm going to I just want y'all to know, if y'all want to learn how to grow, I have a free Mother's Day event this Sunday. Yeah, free Mother's Day event this Sunday. It's called, uh, 
check out my website. I got some stickers and stuff for y'all. And I got free t-shirts in my car for y'all and everything. What's the website? And the website is buttermilk420farms.com. I'm on Instagram as private, so I gotta check you out before you get on my phone. Alright? So I'll help you out. Free, I'll come on down. Buttermilk420farms.com. We got a free event for Mother's Day this Sunday. Everybody's welcome. Well, you know what, today's going to come back to the fellas next time, okay? Hello and good evening. My name is LaForn Word of the Brooklyn Cannabis Collective, a uh, non-profit educational-based organization out of Beth and Stassen. Um, I have a question for you guys, and if anyone can answer this. Is there any real legitimate conversation for the African-American community about organized money, our organized money, Last year, um, $9.6 million was raised in an IPO under the Tulsa Real Estate Fund. Is there any legitimate talks now going on about us getting together and actually raising capital? Because private equity firms, venture capital firms, and other individuals with uh, large capital assets are actually engulfing the industry and taking over significant market share. Please, please. So there are, hey, what's up, um, uh, thanks for starting that organization. So uh, personally, we've raised a significant amount of, of money for our, our company, um, mostly through my network. Oh, okay. network oh. um, so yeah, I was gonna say that we've, we've raised a significant amount of money through my personal networks. Um, there, are, there are companies that are uh, raising, uh, there, there are a couple of companies like Viola, Viola out of Colorado and California, Al Hanson. A uh, couple of celebrities and the athlete and uh, sports athletes. So, in terms of the conversation about a fund, yes, that's very important, especially when we talk about social equity plays that um, that she mentioned earlier in the uh, the evening. So, yeah, we should be pulling our money. We should be looking at stocks. Um, in terms of um, the way I see it, is man, there's a lot of people that do want to invest in cannabis. Like, for instance, I, I didn't have any problems finding investors. Um, just based off of uh, track record, uh, talking to people and, and networking and understanding how, you know, how, the way I saw the world working. So, um, you know, our company is minority owned um, and we sell to everyone. But essentially it's about um, putting the right players in place and we do want to create these funds. There, there are a lot of high net worth individuals that are minorities that are definitely interested in this space. We have to educate them and let them know that. Um, their returns are going to be uh, be met. They'll be able to see some profit and have a, a, a solid business plan and structure in place for them to see their, their investment come to fruition. So yeah, it definitely does exist. There definitely are some some big funds out there, and there's some major players that are really financing some really really solid operations. So it does exist. But in New York City, I don't think we know all these players. But these players, a lot of them are on you know West Coast, and you probably know some on the East Coast as well. But we're definitely in the game, but our story is untold. That's one of the reasons why you're here as well, is to tell our story. I want to tell you, please do that. Please organize in your community. Make it Brooklyn-wide. Don't limit it. And make sure, like you had asked, what are what is everyone's specialty in here? When you organize to do this crowdfunding, to raise your capital, find out who are the finance people, who are the people who want to grow, who are the people who want to process, who are the people who want to dispense, and organize that way so you have the seed to sale vertical integration, even if it's broken up in different components, and then you can pool all your money together and you get someone else to, to help with that, but you have, to have, you have to organize, you have to communicate, and you have to find out who's talented in what areas and just make a business plan like that and go after it, but you can do that. You should. Thank you. The Florida Cannabis Business Association is also working on addressing this. Um, the minority investors are coming to us, so we are uh, working on a program to facilitate deal flow. And it will, uh, there will be two sides of it. There will be the side of, you know, the folks that want to invest $1,000, $5,000. But then there will also be that side for the accredited investor who's coming in and, you know, ready to put up 250000 a million. Uh, so we are going to address the needs of uh, these wealthy uh, minorities as well as the businesses that need money and would like to be funded by 
um, their, our dollars. So it, it's one of the most exciting projects that I'm working on this year with the MCBA um, because what we do know is that we can go in and affect policy. Because it, let's, let's look at it like this. The state of New York, the state of Florida, a few people got together in a room and said, let's create a program that will allow just us to get in. And in Florida, it was six people. In New York, it was a, it was a handful more because it's New York. But what we're going back and doing on the policy side of things to address that um, will not be uh, effective if we don't create funds specifically to grow minority businesses. Those social equity programs that we're talking about, great, sound good, needs money. So the agencies need money, the businesses need money. There's going to be a, an opportunity for us to partner with industry, but we also have cannabis tax revenue, and we need to dedicate some of that to funding these businesses. And so you'll see us talking about that quite a bit, and we've got some amazing legislators at the federal level and at the state level here in New York um, that are working to address this. May 23rd, uh, the Drug Policy Alliance is going to have three shuttle buses to Albany for Lobby Day. This is an opportunity for you to participate in the process and go talk to your elected officials. Um, Drug Policy Alliance, uh, Minorities for Medical Marijuana, Start Smart New York. These are all organizations you should be very familiar with. If you're not, please go look them up, sign up for their newsletters, go to the events because they host events in minority communities looking for the same people who are trying to make it in the in the industry and there's more resources available because they're industry specific. So Drug Policy Alliance, Minorities for Medical Marijuana, Start Smart New York, May 23rd, uh, Lobby Day, clear your calendar, go to Albany, talk to those people. Thank you. My name is Michelle Phillips. I'm an attorney. I'm coming into the industry as a compliance and regulatory attorney because there's no women or anyone of color in the industry that looks like me as of today. In regards to creating your team, how many of you guys know of a water attorney? A what? A water attorney. So when you start thinking about cultivation and becoming a farmer, one thing you need to know, you cannot use federal water. That's number one. Number two, you need a commercial real estate attorney. Because even if you have a commercial space and that you build out, you need to have provision in your commercial contract if there's a school built 100 yards or a church, your lease is going to be terminated. Number three, in the state of New York, you need to understand the DRAM law. The DRAM law applies to alcohol. It's also going to apply to dispensary when it comes to recreational use. That's a liability. As an attorney, ethically, we cannot advise you because there is a gray area. We cannot advise you to engage in criminal enterprise. And that is the sale of marijuana because it's still scheduled. So if you're going to come into the industry, be diligent, be proactive, do your due diligence. Your team should consist of a trademark attorney, a patent attorney. You're going to have to deal with FTC, FDIC, FDA. You're going to have to, New York is so heavy regulated that by the time you're done, you do your due diligence, you may not want to be in the industry. That's number four. In regards to building your team, when it comes to the license and the application, everyone has, you have to disclose everyone. So if you have someone on your team that has a prior conviction, you need to start getting that case that those convic convictions sealed in the state of New York. And you can only seal three misdemeanor or federal or state, and they cannot be federal. So if you have someone on your team, and it has to be 10 years old or older, it cannot be federal, it can't be out of state, and it cannot be anyone with a valid felony or sex crime. So in regards to your due diligence, I sleep this, I eat this, 
coming into the industry. My first actual trial was for DUI. People need to understand if you're stopped for DUI driving under the parent marijuana, do not take the agree to the blood test. First of all, THC cannot determine the level of impairment. They can determine that it's in your system, but as we all know, it takes 60 days for THC to get out of your system. I was able to get acquittal. I beat up the prosecutors, your know, um, toxicologists, because in the end of the day, I applaud this panel, but as people of color, I grew up on East Star Parkway between Underhill and Washington. I was there when they had the black market, when all the weed shops was there. So excuse me, excuse me. Understand. Steve, I'm so sorry, but we, we want to be educated by the panelists. We would love to invite you at another time, but right now, let's hear from the panelists. So we rather, we need questions instead of um. in this space. Um, so I'm really just trying to understand, one, the role of your organizations, your institutions, and really kind of providing internships. Because so much of the stuff that you guys spoke about was really this hands-on learning process. So even thinking of the students here at Mecca, and I'm like an adjunct professor here, so I'm even thinking about, well, how do I have these conversations with the young people who come to my class smelling real loud, right? Um, <laughs> Right, so what's the, what's the role of, of kind of working with these anchor institutions in the community and really these, um, these learning institutions and providing like internships to really get a hands-on experience as to what's happening in all the different sectors of the field? Yeah, I'll start first. Um, so this, this conversation was really a thought starter, really. A thought starter in engaging uh, the university on cannabis. So there definitely needs to be more follow-ups, more panels that are specific, and literally like more time, days, weeks needs to be dedicated towards the industry because it's so, it's, it's so many layers to it. So this really serves up as a thought starter to get the conversation flowing. And it's, it's exciting because a lot of people are passionate about it. And it just uh, goes to show that we need to have this conversation take place uh, more frequently so we can get some more understanding. Um, New York City and New York, well, New York State is a very complicated place and has a wide group of people that we really need to talk to, many aspects of the plan. So, um, you know, the goal of this, um, this panel is to bring people in from different aspects of the industry and give a general, um, a general understanding of, of, of what we see in the legal markets and what happens when it comes to New York. So we want to give some insight and give you a, pretty much a, um, 
the cliff notes of you know, possibly New York City, New York State, what's happening. So I'll just start with that. And very specifically, I know you spoke about having, we have these 10 um, institutions in New York City currently that are in this space, so really thinking about those spaces. And as New York City is doing a lot of work on justice reform, especially for our youth, our, our 16 and 17 year olds, so what I'm seeing is, that's the field that I come from, right? Yeah. I'm seeing that there is a connection for the reasons why young people were going, um, were being um, incarcerated, but then also trying to plan out these these really interesting um, kind of career pathways for them, and really kind of speaking on like this is your strength, this is the, this is the space that you're coming from. So how do we make this a career for you? And I think that's the real gap that I'm really just trying to understand outside of like this space in my everyday work. Well, the Minority Cannabis Business Association is a trade organization. We are focused on the communities that were devastated by the war on drugs. And so our membership are you know, licensed operators, some of these multi-state operators. Uh, we have amazing partnerships and we would not be able to do the policy work, uh, provide the educational and networking opportunities without industry partners. And so what's important for me now is to connect with educators. For you to say, hey, I teach, uh, I teach finance or accounting. Could you send me a cannabis CPA? Because here's, here's what everybody knows how to balance you know, a P&L or how to make business decisions um, based on that. But what you also have to know in cannabis is that if I'm going after a license, if I'm doing a business plan for can for cannabis, a plant touching cannabis business, I need the accountant in the room day one to tell me how to lay out this facility so that I can protect myself from um, the issues related to taxing or uh, taxation, right? 280E is a very real issue for the cannabis industry and that's a whole other conversation. But there are very um, real issues that are going to need to be solved and the folks that are in these classrooms are the ones that are going to do that. Um, if you are a food scientist or you're teaching biology, you know, say, hey, I would like for someone from your process, a, a company that does processes, to come into the classroom and talk to my students. I applaud you for not turning those kids away that come in the classroom loud. Right? Because that's, that's what turns them off. That's what sends them out there. So you saying, hey, there's a real opportunity. You're obviously po a passionate about this. Now let me balance you it up. Let me polish you up and position you to leverage that. When I was able to really immerse myself in this industry, those sacrifices that you mentioned did not feel like sacrifices. I remember sitting in client meetings and wanting to scream because I'm working so hard and these people don't care about me and, and the work I'm doing won't impact you know anybody in any any real way except making these people rich. So when I marry my passion with my skill, I'm living my best life, literally. I'm not because everything I do has purpose. I think also we have to remember there's still consequence. I think that generational thing, right? So it's still not okay yet. And I think what we're saying is get ready for it to be okay. So it's about preparation. And like, you can make a wrong move now, right? Because you think it's going to be legal. You're like, you know what, whatever, I'm going to do this. If it's not licensed to go out and just publicly smoke, because you may not have a chance when it does arrive for you to do it. So like, I think it's that part right there, the generation. Like, it's not just fun. We're talking business up here. We're not talking fun. So like, if you just want to go have fun, that's something different than the cannabis business. So I think that's really important to distinguish those two different things. Hello, my name is Shamar Thompson. I'm an accounting major. And I'd like to say I'm a part of the ethics community of, Med of Medgar Evers. That's kind of a joke. Uh, I'm really interested in the ethics part of the cannabis industry. We can all agree that cannabis is strongly policed, but not necessarily regulated in the sense that access to it isn't seen as difficult. And so my question is, 
with the full legalization and regula uh, regulation of cannabis simply create another instance of a pseudo-controlled substance that's easily criminalized, like alcohol? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that is very well much possible. Unless, unless, unless you legislate otherwise. It's, it's, right now you're in the, right now we're in the phase of cannabis and like when liquor first, you know, when the prohibition on liquor first ended. Um, you have liquor companies that we all still drink till today. I can name a few. Uh, Paul, you want to help me out? <laughs> um, um, that are still, that started in the prohibition process and they, they're still here. But when you walk into a liquor store, you have your top brands and then you also have the, there's so much like, I mean, Hennessy is not the only cognac. You know what I'm saying? Ciroc is not the only vodka. Uh, there's, there's, there's so much, there's so much that you can offer, but that is the risk. But that's business, you know, that, that's, it's just business across the board. You have to have, the government has to feel like they have control of something at all times. It's, it, that's something that we can't change unless we move to another country. But this it, 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 you know, we are in America and we do have to deal with when things go legal, they do form other things around it to still make money off of criminalizing the still. DUIs, which you just mentioned, um, all across the board, but that yeah, that's that's the openness of it. You know, I call it the <coughs> the fun part. It's the part where you get to put strategy in business and hopefully like she mentioned, people to protect the government from doing things like that. For example, in Colorado, um, I did a marketing photo shoot by the Great Sand Dunes. I did not know that it was federal property. Um, I'm an owner. So I got a federal fine. It had to be a federal case in Colorado on cannabis. And, and I beat it with no lawyer. Okay. So um, all that to say that do you know what it feels like to have a badge on your chest and then, you know, be in the back of a police car because for cannabis, you're in Colorado? Like, if I can't be in Colorado and smoke weed, where can I go? That's how I feel. But I didn't, it's, it hit me. You're not excused from anything. No matter how illegal, no matter how legal, it doesn't, you still have to follow laws around certain things. So, I am a, a witness to being criminalized in an in a, in a industry that's legal. But I was able to lose that case. So what I will say is that it's not that bad. You know, don't let the fear of like, oh, if cannabis does go fully legal, what does that mean for us? And if cannabis stays illegal, what does that mean for us? I mean, you're almost trying to ask questions that only God can answer. So, in my opinion, you get in, educate yourself, look up other countries like Israel, look up other countries like South Africa, look up other countries and laws that they have in Canada, in Amsterdam, I mean travel, you know, a group of you guys could easily start a cannabis traveling club where you guys choose to go to states that are legal and you do research and development in those states. So put together a fund. You can't see, when, when you're in a place with no with, with minimum light, you know, you, you have to be willing to bring more light to the situation. So you guys are in New York, and I, I did a little bit of research on the criminalization, especially of minorities before I came here. And I will tell you that I am disgusted with the world. And it sucks that I can't take my legal laws in Colorado and land them here with me and be like, okay, everybody stay. You guys don't have to go through this no more. You guys don't have to, you know, sit in a room like this and be like, you know, how do I get in the industry? It's so criminalized here. How do I do it? You have to go outside of your comfort zone sometimes to be able to bring understanding back to your people. So by me choosing to work 
with in, in, a, in a partnership of I'm the only minority woman. I didn't do that to be in a, a sexy cannabis group. I didn't do that to say, oh, I smoke weed, I'm a cannabis owner. I did that so I can truly understand how people outside of our race think about business and money. And I have got that understanding. So what I will say to you as my brother is you have to be willing to get outside your comfort zone. Travel outside of the wall of the world. Go to places that are doing what you want to do. And then bring that knowledge back. That's the only way you can solve the issue of her question, where is where is the um the I'm sorry, it just slipped my mind, where you can the, the um the internships. So for example, what I do for 420, I had a minority 420 tour at my facility where nothing but minorities were able to come and tour my four facilities and ask me as many questions as they wanted to ask me about what they wanted to do. After I did the tour, I, asked them, I, I, I gave them all the opportunity to do an internship with me. Out of the 30 of us that did the tour, only five of them came back. So my question would then be back is, when you do have people who are willing to put their life on the line to make sure that we can make opportunities, are you guys going to be receptive to them in a way of understanding and actually listening to listen, not listen to reply? We didn't, we're not putting our life on the line to, to, to come out and lie to you guys. That's what that, that's the point is. So, you also have to be willing to step out of your own boundaries. Because this industry is a football. I call it football. And I never say football because I'm a girl. But if I could imagine what football felt like, it would be the cannabis industry. It's a full contact sport. You are tackled every day. You've got to be willing to get up, get the ball, and still want to make a touchdown. And not only that, but you got tackled by people who don't look like you. So that even feels worse. But most of us would run away. Blame it on racism. Blame it on segregation. Let's just do it. Because it, 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 I mean, how many times a day <laughs> do we have to do that? How many times a day does this, this, this color of our skin come into play on opportunities? Every day. So, yeah, it's frustrating. <laughs> But you do put yourself in a position to give people opportunities and they decline them because they're not willing to step out of their own comfort zone. So get out of New York. Go and explore other places that are doing what you guys want to do because in Colorado I am seeing more black people come up than I, have, I ever have. And it is a very humbling experience to witness. I, I mean, the owner of a Roman dispensary, one of the biggest dispensaries in Commerce City, is owned by two black guys and a Jew. And you know what those two black guys did? They kicked the Jew out of being able to make any type of business decisions, but they still get his money. So I see my people do things that I've watched other people say we can't do. Not only that, but I've done it. Just like we do business camps for two months, three months, if you guys are really, really serious about this, and this is something that you really, really, really want to do, and if you guys are in college, and if you guys get summer breaks, spend, spend two to three months. If you're really serious, and even the lawyer, uh, the lady that got a chance to talk, who said a, who said a lot of beneficial things, but that does change state to state. So if you're in New York, but you want to go own a business in Florida, or you want to go own a business in Colorado or California, that, those, those lawyer laws aren't going to apply to those states. Everywhere is different. I work with lawyers in New York. This, by the way, this is my first time in New York, and I've worked with lawyers here before, and I have never touched the grounds here. So that just shows you the variety that, that, that does exist in this industry. I live in Colorado. I work with lawyers in New York. I live in Colorado. I finance people in Florida. I live in Colorado. I have brand and website developers in California, Atlanta, and Louisiana. So nothing stops any of them. I mean, let me tell you how many people I've hired on Indeed.com that I now pay five to six grand a month. 
how many people have applied to me from New York saying, hey, I'm moving to move to Colorado. This is my resume. This is what I have to offer. I'm not telling you guys to leave this state. But what I am doing is I'm saying that you, you have to, you have, you're responsible to bring life back to this state. So just like all of us came from other places, just like Paul mentioned, to come and bring life to, you know, the cannabis industry, now that we've brought that light to you guys on what's really going on, it's now your responsibility, just like it's ours, to go do the same thing. It's just passing along information. So please don't like, don't think there's one way to do something. There's a million ways to get rich. But if you don't want to step out your comfort zone, you're gonna limit weight, so your own weight, and it's good. Ultimately, what I've experienced is it's self, it's, it's self fault. You know, you have to take accountability. You have to do things for self. You can't use your skin color. You can't put that in the universe. And I wish my people, and I'm sorry I'm taking up some time right now, but I just wish, I wish, one thing I do wish is I wish that we would understand our power from a spiritual and a mental standpoint. And I wish that we would stop using this and being so scared of our own skin. It's like, you, we, the main question everybody asks is how do I how do I become successful as a black person? And it's almost like what? You're a human man. You breathe. This is this is one segment of you. Who cares about your skin complexion if you know more than this? Show it. Put yourself in that position. Piss them off. <laughs> Piss them off. That's what we've been doing for years, and we are good at it. <laughs> so continue to piss them off. If I had any advice, it would be to piss them off. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, I have one. I think maybe the last question. Would you sit with me? Thank you all for setting the bar so high. So this is the first in what we hope will be a series of town halls and they be fantastic. That said, what have given me so much food for thought. I don't know when I'm going to finish digesting all of it, but I'm going to be leaving it truly inspired. So I have two questions. One, do you have room on your staff owner and a chemist? I'm a chemist here, faculty. So just in case, in I like the house. She can't go anywhere. So. <laughs> Now, in terms of curriculum development, which we have started looking at, my question is, which is with respect to the analysis. So there are lots of products that you all the, the medical dispensary, the recreational products, <coughs> and the distributor, distributors are selling a range of products, different concentrations of CBDs, different concentrations of THCs. My question is, where do you do that analysis to ensure product consistency? Do you do that? In-house? Do you have a lab built in to do that in-house? And if so, So, when you think about analysis, you're going to want to do this analysis at a few different points, right? And so as a producer, as a cultivator, you are absolutely testing product before you send it out to a to what is the state lab today, but will be opened up to private labs in the future. So another opportunity in here for the scientists, folks that have ES, yes. that's what they're trying to do. That is, that is where we need to be preparing yeah. now. Agreed. Okay, just across the bridge, New Jersey, uh, doing the same thing, moving away from depending on the state lab to do testing. And so they're going to open up licensing for uh, independent testing facilities. Uh, those are the kinds of jobs and, and career, not only just career and job, but entrepreneurial uh, endeavors that we need to prepare um, the folks in this room for. Uh, you know, I know we have minority-owned labs that do other types of uh, work in the state. Being able to go to them and say, hey, um, have you thought about cannabis? And marrying them up with a cannabis expert to, um, you know, create a revenue stream for an existing lab. 
um, internal operations, there's typically someone hired to, to do that work. I know in Maryland, um, again, we test everything before we go spend the money to have it tested outside. Yeah, essentially in New York, um, the organizations that have the licenses, some do their independent testing in their own facility before they send it to the state lab, which is run by the Department of Health. There's a huge backlog, so it takes a really long time. I think they are going to be opening that up to other um, labs to be able to participate and do the analysis. Um, but one of the things I had proposed to Cuomo's office was to start an internship program through the SUNY schools to have a pipeline of people going in and, sorry, <laughs> so um, that they can, they can go through the state schools and have county labs so that all of the businesses on the county level would be able to go and have an affordable place to have their products tested because not everyone can afford an HPLC uh, or know how to operate one. So it's important that you test at every stage, you're testing the flour, you're testing the extract, you're testing the potency across the board. And the future is really testing the spread of cannabinoids and evaluating those benefits and finding what ailments that spread of specific cannabinoids treats. And so looking into the specific effects of cannabinoids and terpenes is really smart. Thank All right. you. Uh, we got a special question from Special Snowman. All right, this is Paul Sanders' mother. Good evening. My name is Marlene Saunders, and I'm a graduate of McGillivray's College. <laughs> and I'm very proud to see what it is now to what it was before. So I am glad that I have the opportunity to just say a couple words. I really appreciate everyone who came here today because my mouth is open, and I'm going to be in California with him. So, <laughs> he doesn't know that yet. So this is what the plan is. I'm going to resign. I'm still working for somebody else, and work for my sister. So, I, I like to see science. I love science because at this university, McEvers College, Dr. Betty Shabazz, taught me science and how to do it. And I could never forget that. So I really wanted to say this first few words because she left a legacy inside of me that I can see the crest of the cycle up to now. I can and imagine how things go, how it works and everything. You don't have to tell me this is this. I could tell you. You know, so I just want to say that, and I want to wish each and every one of you good luck. All right, keep smiling. The road is not for the strippers, but those who enjoy it today. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry. So, in the interest of time, because we're way over time. <laughs> We're going to continue to have this conversation on campus and um, we're going to continue with the questions offline out of respect for everyone that still does have questions. We'll have a few moments in the lobby to get those out. Um, also, I encourage you all to visit the um, MDEC, Male Development and Empowerment Center, to uh, continue the conversation as well as the Entrepreneurial um, Business Club. Um, many of these um, institutions on campus are open spaces where we can come and express ourselves and it's censor free. So at this time, I just want to give a huge round of applause. I think everybody should be up and applauding our Absolutely fascinating. I am just so proud and so full. Give yourselves a hand. This is a wonderful crowd. It's been a wonderful panel. Oh, it's just awesome. Multi generational. Other end. Yeah. Youngest is down there, seven months. Seven months. Yeah. <laughs>
So D Roll, let's, let, let, let's just kind of ask some of our students. Let's just give a real big shout out to some of our students. Students, give yourselves a big, 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 big hand. Can we also give a shout out to the MCs, Joe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give a shout out to the MCs. It's okay. You guys, you guys, you guys, you know, what we were saying when we were listening there, we were saying, man, these kids are so goddamn proud. What was it? Let's say it Let's say it again. Let's say it again. Let's say it again. You know, can we say thank you to the production team? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, can we say thank you to the production team? The production team, students start coming up, we want to yeah, take a photo. Okay, we want to take a photo, so the production team, you guys, okay. come on up. Yeah, oh yeah, uh, yeah, you want to hand out these plants, uh, pack plaques to the panelists. Yep. Uh, no, no, <laughs> Vanessa Davis, Baja Davis, outstanding presentation. Uh, well, 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 talk and about I, and I live in Colorado too. <laughs> Devon, Christopher Johnson. Yes, Chris. Shanita Penny. Do you guys want to stand up? Colleen Hughes. Thank you. Yeah, and while they're doing that, let, let, let's ask and the... And Mr. Paul Sanders. Let's ask the Let's Talk Cannabis Scaring Kids. Please, sir, come on up. You can hang them on the wall, and you can whack your enemies over the head. <laughs> hey, folks, can we, can we also give a good word for the Crumb Heights, the Crumb Union Events Production Group? Yeah, can we ask them to come up to those folks from Crumb Union Production? If you're here, just come on up. You're here. Okay, very good, very good. Hey, where's Professor Bangguru? Is he here? Can we ask him to come up? Oh, he's already here. He's already here. I just want to make note on the last couple of pages of your program, we have 37 Medgar Everett Colleges student businesses on the campus. Give them a hand. There are also vendors outside waiting for you to come out. Uh, I think some of them are cannabis vendors. Well, maybe not. <laughs> so, do you do you have any words of wisdom? I mean, this panel was just great. This panel was awesome. I heard about passion. I heard about vision. I heard about accountability. I heard about responsibility. And for those of you who are in school, Bring the best that you can be wherever you are. I heard that uh, you don't have to touch the plant, and uh, you can. I won't let you touch the plant. I will touch it for you. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Zero. Can I say buttermilk420.com? <laughs>
you guys hold out. Let's just also really say thank you to this really, really wonderful audience. I mean, I, I thought the question at the end was really, really super. And, you know, young man, that, 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 that showed real erudition, if I might say that myself. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to be a tutor, man. You should be a professor, that kind of question you asked right there. That was deep, man. That was real deep.